It's always a great joy when I can go on camera and talk about how a new round of funding has been announced for an American nuclear startup. It doesn't matter whether it's fusion or fission, the motto here is more nuclear is best. Today I'm happy to announce that Helion Energy has received an investment round of $2.2 million. A figure which I think- Hey, Sean, um, you are missing a comma and about three zeros with that. I beg your pardon? Yeah, it's it's 2.2 billion. No, because I got the TechCrunch article right here and yeah. it clearly- You know I'm right. Holy sh- Hello and welcome to Rock Logic. I'm your host, Sean Kenny. And before we get started, I want to ask you to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. If you like today's episode or want to ask me something, please leave your comments below. Your feedback helps us a lot. Now we got a great episode for you all today, starting with some great news. A Washington-based nuclear startup has officially received a significant amount of private capital to test, develop, and commercialize nuclear fusion. That company is Helion, and earlier this month, they secured a $500 million Series E with an additional $1.7 billion of funding commitments tied to specific milestones. The round was led by Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI and former president of Y Combinator. Existing investors include co-founder of Facebook, Dustin Makowitz, Peter Thiel's Mithril Capital, and notable sustainable tech investor, Capricorn Investment Group, also participated in the round. This is, of course, on top of the $77 million in previous public and private sector investments since the company was founded eight years ago. So with all these big players putting skin in the game, you may be wondering, what the hell are these guys working on that has everyone so worked up? For starters, Helion Energy is a fusion startup. This may not be a big surprise, and we have covered fusion energy startups in previous episodes, but the key takeaway here is that this company wants to use helium-3 to achieve something called a neutronic fusion. But what exactly is a neutronic fusion, and why is it so cool and innovative? The basic principle of fusion is you take two of the lightest elements on the periodic table, like a helium atom and a hydrogen atom, and you fuse them together to make a crap ton of energy. Challenges of how you achieve that aside, the science of how it works is very well understood. Now, there are several approaches to achieve this. Previously on the show, we've discussed the fusion reactor concepts of both general fusion and commonwealth fusion. These companies have different approaches for achieving fusion. General fusion looks to achieve fusion by means of compressing liquid metal, while commonwealth is looking to use highly advanced rare earth magnets to achieve confinement. However, they both have one thing in common. They plan on using tritium to achieve the reaction. Now, tritium is a rare radioactive isotope of hydrogen that is used in everything from glow-in-the-dark exit lights to hydrogen bombs. When you fuse tritium and deuterium, you achieve fusion energy, but you also create a lot of neutrons. Left unchecked, this could cause serious damage to the exterior of the reactor, as well as create ionizing radiation that could cause severe biological harm. Thankfully, both companies have a solution to mitigate this by using either a liquid lithium lead solution or FLYB in Commonwealth's case to absorb those neutrons and prevent those pesky issues. This works great, but it does add mass, cost, and a layer of complexity to any fusion design. In Helion's case, they won't need to do this. That is because they are using helium-3, which is a light, stable isotope of helium with two protons and one neutron. Helium-3 is very stable, and it generates a lot of energy without releasing a lot of dangerous radiation. While the former approaches may release up to 80% of the energy in the form of neutrons, a neutronic reactions, like the one in Helion's approach, release energy in the form of charged particles, typically protons and alpha particles. This not only negates the need for radiation shielding, but creates an exciting opportunity. Every approach we've discussed in power production, whether that's from fossil fuels, nuclear fission, or even up and coming fusion concepts, always involves converting thermal energy into electrical energy by way of a turbine or something. But with a neutronic fusion, you don't need to. Helium plans on using deuterium and helium-3 to create fusion and convert it to electricity by direct 
energy conversion. Using helium-3, helium plans on using the expansion of the plasma to induce a current in the magnetic compression and acceleration coils, which in turn translates into high energy alpha particles directly into voltage. This practically eliminates the need for turbines, cooling towers, or other means to absorb excess waste heat. As much as I like to talk about process applications of waste heat generated from molten salt reactors, I have to admit, this energy conversion process is out of this world and can lead to some exciting applications. But before I get ahead of myself, I need to address a few things. For starters, how far along is Helion in the development of this technology? After all, the company was only founded eight years ago. Well, the answer is actually pretty far. Since the company's founding in 2013, they have developed over half a dozen prototypes to fine tune the science and design of what will eventually become their first commercial reactor. Earlier this year, the sixth prototype, codenamed Trenta, had reached 100 million degrees Celsius, as well as magnetic compression fields in excess of 10 Tesla. Their seventh prototype, codenamed Polaris, is expected to be completed in 2023 and plans to greatly accelerate the development of their design concept. So they seem to have the science part locked down and clearly money isn't a factor. However, one has to ask, where does one get the fuel to make the engine run? Well, deuterium, or DO2 for short, is essentially just heavy water. And it's pretty common in nature. The process to extract it is very well understood. You just take regular water and distill the heavy water that makes up a small fraction of it. This is currently used for various industrial, military, and scientific applications. In Canada, they use heavy water instead of light water in their can-do reactors to absorb neutrons. So getting deuterium isn't an issue. Helium-3 is a bit more of a challenge. It's not naturally abundant here on Earth, and the way we get it now is by the natural decay of tritium, which is currently managed by the U.S. Department of Energy. That's okay if you're doing science experiments, but to create enough energy to replace fossil fuels and other forms of renewables, you need a lot more helium-3. Thankfully, there's a lot on the moon, enough to justify the creation of a large lunar mining operation that would result in the creation of large communities and even massive cities in the not so distant future. But there's a hell of a lot more in the gas giants of the outer solar system. While the reserves are massive, one has to ask how long will it last us here on Earth, taking into account exponential growth. Thankfully, I don't have to do the math on this because someone else has already done it for me. In 2019, Robert Zubrin, a notable aerospace engineer and founder of the Mars Society, published a book called The Case for Space. We have it linked in the description below. In it, he highlights the technologies in development as well as opportunities that can be gained by exploiting space resources. While reading, I came across two charts. One highlights the amount of energy humanity will consume in the years between now and the dawn of the 23rd century. The other highlights the amount of energy that can be produced in terawatt years for each energy resource. Looking at the first chart and going down, it shows that we need 7,000 terawatt years just to get us to the next century and over 96,000 terawatt years of energy to get us to the year 2200. To put that into perspective, the whole world is expected to consume 28 terawatt years worth of energy from multiple sources in the year 2025. Can we get there with what we have? And if not, can helium-3 from space help? According to Zubrin, we have about 3,000 terawatt years of energy from known terrestrial fossil fuels, plus another 7,000 from unknown terrestrial fossil fuels. I'm not sure if that includes like gas hydrates, but regardless, that's enough to get us to the year 2100. While assuming no other energy reserves are used, which is silly because of course we're gonna exploit fission. Fission without breeders uh, is not that great, but with breeders, we get about 22,000 terawatts years worth of energy. I don't know if that is taking into account um, the amount of thermal efficiency from molten salt reactors or uh, if they're even included at all. But regardless, that combined with fossil fuels gets us beyond the year 2150. Now, what can we do with helium-3? Just extracting it from the moon, there's more than enough to get us to the next century and beyond. But when you get helium-3 from the gas giants, we start seeing some big numbers. 5.6 billion terawatt years from Jupiter, a little over 3 billion from Saturn, with a similar amount from Uranus, and 2.1 billion from Neptune. Combine them all together and you get 13.9 billion terawatt years worth of energy from the outer planets. 
It's no wonder Zubrin calls this region of space the Persian Gulf of the solar system. Mind you, this is exploiting an energy source that emits no carbon, no pollution, very little radiation compared to other sources, and can make use of a potentially efficient energy conversion process. It wouldn't just solve our energy woes, but open up the solar system to commerce. And when you take into account that helium-3 fusion has more energy density per unit mass, then you can start applying this to a whole range of technological developments, like creating a propulsion system like the Epstein Drive in the Expanse, allowing humanity to traverse our solar system, not months or years, but weeks or even days, maybe even one day get us to Alpha Centauri in a matter of decades. But that is a topic for another time. For now, I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic.